War, Love, Meow by Dr. Dylan Doe. Chapter 3. Trey contemplated killing every last member of Parliament for what this Republic did to his tribe. A wall of trees surrounded a large natural clearing that could hold thousands of meowies. He sat in a mass of Republicans formed in a semicircle, facing the rows of rocks in the other half of the clearing set up for Parliament members. A distinctive row of stones projected above the others for party leaders and speakers. He didn't normally attend these hearings, as he was not a true Meowie of the Meowie Republic, but he was in the area. Trey pushed his way to the front of the crowd. I can't believe how many Meowies show up to view the nonsense of politics. For most Meowies, pushing to the front would have been impossible. He didn't even need to use his massively powerful muscles. He smirked at the uncomfortable expressions of Republicans as they parted in front of him. Parliament members pranced in. The proceedings would start soon. A dragonfly flew above the crowd. The heads and eyes of a thousand meowies darted back and forth to follow it. A few paws batted in its direction. Trey saw his chance. He leapt above the crowd, bared his sharp fangs, and crunched the dragonfly in his powerful jaws. Meowies quickly jumped out of the way to clear his landing. Trey chewed and swallowed the bug. Mmm, nice snack. See, I don't need no fairy-enhanced muscles to impress these soft Republicans. Trey walked cockily back to the front of the crowd as the Meowies watched him in awe. Everyone was in place. The tallest rock acted as a podium for speakers. The spirit Meowie, dressed in a purple robe and a ridiculous purple hat, stood on the rock. Meowies of our glorious republic, we thank the one true God who blesses our people and our freedoms, who guides our nation and our personal lives to live right and true. May he watch over us as we work today. Let us purr. Thousands of Meowies in the crowds and the members of parliament loudly purred in unison. Purr. Purr. The spirit Meowie lifted his head and leapt down from the rock, purple robe flowing behind him. Prime Minister Meowgrit Scratcher bounded to the speaker rock. She wore a little top hat with a red feather to signify her position. Trey tensed up at the sight of her. She served as his boss, leader, and arch enemy all at once. It was her conservative party who led a slash and burn policy against his Meowhican tribe in order to eliminate them. And now Trey worked at her command. He wasn't even a true citizen, but he followed her orders like any soldier. Few would think to cross Meowgrit Scratcher, the Iron Meowie. She spoke, Members of the Meowie Parliament and citizens of the Meowie Republic, today an event occurred that will change our understanding of our place in the universe. An event that could threaten our small nation, our small species, our small planet. Meowies in the crowd adjusted anxiously at the word planet. I can't believe so many Meowies allow themselves to be sucked into such political rhetoric. Our planet? Nonsense. The Prime Minister held her paw in the air, then quickly brought it to her chest to signal Meowies to come forward from the thick forest behind the speaker rock. Trey's eyes widened and jaw dropped. Heavy feet crunched upon the forest floor. As Bibi and Elame escorted two giant fairies without wings, Trey never even heard of such creatures existing. They had the torsos of centaurs, but the legs of monster fairies, and their faces looked more squished than a centaur's face, their skin darker. Trey glanced around. Not a single meow in the clearing appeared any less confused than him. Bibi and Elame escorted the two creatures to the small space between the crowd and the rocks where members sat. Scratcher spoke. These two creatures are called human beings. Humans for short. They fell from the stars in an advanced craft that crashed into the West River. We must learn from these creatures for a few months. Then we will kill them so they cannot threaten our fair republic. Two smiled at the congregation of talking meowies. She had always liked meowies. She missed meow stud. Wow. So many meowies in mass is adorable, and the Prime Minister wears such a cute little hat. A sense of wonderment flowed through too as she observed the fairies who meekly sat on most of the meowies' heads 
making each meow give off a soft glow. But when Tu heard the phrase, kill them, her good mood came crashing down. Another Meowie wearing a top hat like the Prime Minister's, except with no feather, spoke defiantly from her rock. Kill them? Hasn't your conservative party killed enough creatures in its time? We can learn so much from them, and we have no indication to their threat. Members from the conservative party responded with anger, meows, and hisses, while members in support of the speaker gave meows and cheer of the comment. Hope. Maybe they won't kill us. Viet yelled over the crowd. Honeys, honeys! The opposition meowie is correct. We have so much to offer. We come from a planet far advanced in technology. Think of the power we can lend you. The crowd grew silent as Scratcher stared at Viet. Human, your species can travel the stars. Of course you have power. I have a question. Does your species know war? Viet responded quickly. Oh, yes, ma'am. Man has slaughtered each other like cows for thousands of years. We have fabulous weapons, guns, missiles, lasers, nukes. We can aid you against your enemies. Two glared at Viet. What an idiot. Scratcher's meowy face appeared smug. She glanced at the opposition speaker. See, meowly Clawton? Even your cowardly liberal party can recognize such fantastic weapons as a threat to our species. We cannot let humans live to report the location of our humble planet. Many Meowies meowed in agreement. Two knew her life was on the line. She felt glad to see an opposition Meowie on her side, but Scratcher was the Prime Minister. She probably had the power. Clearly more Meowies were on Scratcher's side. I have to persuade her to let us live. Prime Minister! Prime Minister! The crowd quieted, and Scratcher gazed at Two. Prime Minister Scratcher, I respect your concerns, but we have no way of returning to our planet. The crash destroyed our craft. We have nothing here except the tattered clothes we wear to cover ourselves. We can never report your location. We are trapped here, and only two of us. Please, let us serve as your loyal subjects. Surely our size, hands, and knowledge can assist your great republic. Silence. A star of hope glimmered in the back of Two's mind. Scratcher tilted her head and paused while staring down at the human. The iron meowie re-straightened her head. No, I cannot risk my people. You are to be confined and interrogated, then executed. Meowlery Clawton responded angrily. Freedom! This is an outrage. You can't do this to intelligent beings who pose no threat to us. You monster! The Meowie populace will never stand for this. Many Meowies cheered. Scratcher looked unfazed. Meowerly, do you propose a vote of no confidence? The two top-hatted Meowies stared at one another in silence. I didn't think so. Remove these two humans and keep them under heavy guard. Feed and Two looked at each other and in unison said, Run! They galloped over many startled Meowies. If we can just get to the tree line. Two glanced around. Rather than Meowies forming to stop them, they parted. Scratcher yelled, Soldiers! Something glittered in Two's eyes. She glanced to the side. Meowies draped in chainmail and wearing metal helms sprinted toward them. Two and Viet dashed out of the clearing. They jumped and ducked over vegetation. Their long legs propelled them ahead of the chasing soldiers. Two's chest pained. Viet's heavy breaths came from her left. She backhanded her brother's shoulder, then veered right. Viet followed. They ran until Two knew she had to stop. They both bent over, gasping for air while keeping their eyes on where they came. She expected a stream of shiny soldiers to spring out of the woods at any moment, but none came. Dark shadows of the immense forest lay all around them. A few streams of light created the conditions of dusk. Twigs and leaves rested below their feet. Viet spoke through heavy breaths. These pretty kitties aren't too friendly. Thanks for the obvious, little brother. I wish I could just slap him. Viet locked eyes with Two, put his finger over his mouth, and nodded to the side. Two leaned around a tree. A fairy. It flew hunched over while struggling to maintain its flight, carrying an orange ball larger than itself. Its glowing aurora shimmered in the forest's shade. Viet whispered, Oh. My. God. That fab fairy is carrying a cheese ball. It does look like a cheese ball. 
Her little wings flapped hard, and she groaned to lift the ball into a thick tree with a hole that emitted light. Two and V had crouched forward and each hid behind a thick trunk. They poked around to peer into the tree hole, watching as the petite fairy plopped the giant cheese ball next to an incredibly fat, bald male fairy. The male's wings appeared weak and fractured. While the female wore a sparkly dress, the male wore nothing but briefs. He nibbled on the cheese ball. Viet shook his head and said loudly, Oh no, honey. No, no, no. Make him get his own dang cheese ball. Anger flashed through Tu's mind. She grabbed Viet by the shoulder and whispered harshly, Moron, they are friends with Meowies. They'll report our location. Viet limply slapped her hand away and walked toward the tree hole. Am I really this person's twin? The female fairy smiled and giggled at Viet's approach. Two stepped up behind him. I'm sorry, my little brother speaks too much. She found the fat fairy disgusting as well, but didn't want to upset things. They needed all the friends they could get. Plus, the male's wings clearly were useless. Maybe that's why he needed help. The female fairy smiled. Oh no, this is good. I can roam the forest without worry of lusty males pursuing me, and the men get to be lazy all day every day, as their hearts desire. Look! She held up the male's wings. He never used his wings since birth, so now they don't even work. Tee hee! The male moved his mouth, sending waves of blubber down his fat face as he slurred, Slack Lena! Get the drink! The female fairy turned to the male and put her hands together in front of her while bowing, Yes, husband. She quickly flew out of the tree. Viet turned to Tu and swayed his head with an indignant face. Wow, that's messed up. Tu shook her head. Doesn't matter. Let's move. Meow! A soldier meow, he pulled its head down and charged them. The sound of many padding paws in the forest moved in their direction. Tu and Viet ran. Exhaustion quickly overcame her. She knew she could not escape. She tapped Viet's shoulder and halted. He followed. Her chest ached as she sucked in air. Tu put her hands in the air. We surrender! She wanted to collapse to the floor, but somehow remained standing. While gasping breaths, Viet muttered, Told you, girl! He gulped more air. We should have done those dance classes together. Tu winced.